So I've heard a lot of discussions about uh, people looking at models of collaboration, people looking at uh, trying to get support for a variety of different activities. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something that actually the NIH does pretty well. We support research and development. We support collaborative efforts. Um, and in fact, I'm not alone here today. Um, so, you know, after Cameron called me, I spoke to a few people in my branch, and there are actually three others uh, here as well, which I think is an indication since we're a small branch, since we're a small branch of the level of interest uh, that we have. So the people who are here, um, I'm just going to ask them to identify themselves. Deirdre, uh, who actually deals with genomics and diagnostics, um, and Greg is around here somewhere, or he may be out because uh, he had to take a conference call. Um, so he's our medical officer and deals with clinical trials as well as a variety of clinical research. And then Mike O'Neill, who is back there, um, is our preclinical drug development uh, person. Um, so I actually have a couple of other people working vaccines and vector control, but they, they're not here today. Um, but one of the things that I do want to emphasize is that you can go and talk to them. I know that they'll be available during the lunch break. Um, and you can talk with them about a variety of different mechanisms that we do have to support um, research. For example, we have research grants that go out to uh, small universities, uh, even support undergraduates uh, as part of that program. Uh, we support training grants. We also have um, preclinical services for drug development, vaccine development, and programs to support diagnostics, and we have a vector biology program. And we also have recently gotten into um, support services for uh, development of novel vector control methods, um, and we also have clinical research uh, and trial sites, including the Tropical Medicine Research Centers, which actually have traditionally focused on a number of diseases like leishmaniasis and Chagas disease, actually. So um, I don't think that everybody was aware of that. <laughs> um, and we also support domestic research, too. Um, so How about screening? It depends <coughs> what you want to do. But yes, we can talk about that. Yeah. So in fact, that's a great lead in. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I wasn't actually, paid for that either. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I, had a, I was listening with great interest to a number of these presentations, and, and you know, there were a couple of things that, that um, came home to me, um, one of which is the, I'll, I'll just start off with a, a um, sort of a short story, which I think is just useful to remember. The index case that Carlos Chagas described was actually a patient named Berenice. She was very young, I don't know, three, four maybe, when she was initially identified. It's an interesting story about how he went down to Rio. He was sent out to control a malaria epidemic, ended up seeing this girl, went down to Rio for a reason, came back, and for a variety of reasons drew some blood and, and ended up uh, establishing um, uh, the initial description of Chagas disease as a result of that. But what most people don't realize is that Berenice lived well into her 80s, <laughs> indicating that, yes, you can be infected and you can have this long, latent period. Um, and so I think that's just sort of useful to keep in mind, that even the index case that led Carlos Chagas to, to accomplish this incredible epidemiologic feat of describing everything that, that we basically know about the early stages of the disease um, at that early stage, in the state of the art was actually stemmed from this one patient and then it led to subsequent <laughs> investigations. But a lot of people forget about that. Um, one of the things that sort of struck me as a recurrent theme here is that, one, we're doing this screening when we can, but there is in general a lack of awareness among the populations and among physicians. Um, and my question, and I'll go, I'd be interested in your thoughts about this. You have different communities that you're all dealing with. What do you think are the best ways to raise awareness in those communities? So it's not a question just of doing the screening. You've got to do something to, one, make people come in for screening, but you've also got to do something with the screening to make them 
feel that they can do something with that information. So I'm just going to turn it over to each of you individually and let you respond to that question. So however, you want. we'll start at the far end, okay? I'd say ladies first, but I'd have a choice of four. So. Um, thank you. So one of the things that we've looked at doing is engaging celebrities. So Dr. Hotez actually mentioned this, but sports is a recurring sort of um, common topic. And uh, we've actually identified a few players from endemic countries, for example, on the Red Sox in Boston, um, or also the New England Revolution, which is not as popular, but um, but so trying to really get sort of these champions um, that are out there in the field. And then also similarly trying to engage people who actually are aware. So even though awareness is quite low, um, there have been a few success stories in the community and trying to get them to really champion it. And um, we've started to develop a, a social media and communications platform as well. So looking at different um, ways, like for example, um, like a text it web, uh, a text it mobile phone platform, so people can get initial information through just texting, and so it's really easy. You can just have posters up, people text a number. Like er almost everyone has a cell phone now. It works with even you know the so-called dumb phones. So even if it's not a smartphone, they, it's just a text message, and they can get. We can sort of plant that initial seed, um, and then it's something that's really easy to share. Also, so for example, you know it says you know, um, our next screening is here, and then um, do you want to learn more about Chagas? And it says, these are the endemic countries. And then someone might say, oh, like, I'm from one of those countries, you know? And then say, hey, mom, hey, you know, friend, whatever, look, like, these are endemic countries. Did you know that? Um, so really trying to sort of engage on multiple levels um, with people in the community. Um, so the the interesting point about raising awareness and involving the community, I think it has to do a lot of uh, what you said about the, it's a very distressful, maybe a diagnostic if one one uh, not only knowing about chagas and maybe thinking one could have chagas or not might be a little bit distressing for a person or a family. So what we can I think uh, it would be really good to approach this on the medical standpoint if it's exactly in primary care. Uh, not maybe not in the cardiology when it's too late, but something we could at, approach this as something in the standard of care, like screening in the well child visits or in the prenatal cares, something like that involving a regular visit to the physician that does not necessarily involve disease or some uh, bad consequence of chagas, but more a preventive approach. And in our experience, the, what we have, uh, so we were in contact with the social media too, with the radio, with the television. Uh, many of participants that were listening to us in the radio, then as they started to call us after they listened our announcements in the radio. Uh, another thing that was uh, important is to provide testimony of people that was infected with the disease. Uh, for example, we think that even sometimes for an adult patient, a very old patient, is uh, treatment is very difficult to, to perform in that patient. Uh, one family member shared the history of a participant that was very old. Uh, they didn't know that they had Chagas disease. The doctor here, they didn't know that they had Chagas disease, that this patient has Chagas disease, and this patient was able to receive a heart transplantation. But because they didn't uh, treat for the Chagas infection during the, the immunosuppression, the patient at, at the end died because of this re reactivation of Chagas disease. So um, listening to the testimonies of people that was infected in the community, it really helps uh, to provide more instant time so the people uh, to participate in this kind of activities. Um, also, sending the, res the, the report of all the resources that we have found in the community, for example, to the pastor or to the priest uh, in, the, in the church, is also helps. For example, uh, in, this, uh, in this place, there were 12 persons that were infected with the disease. Uh, some of them were able to receive uh, the evaluation for the cardiology uh, status, and some of them had uh, 
uh, early cardiac alterations that were detected because of the participation in the study. And we also provide information to the pastors if the patients are receiving care uh, after we finish with all the screening procedure. So the participants at the end can, can trust us that the, the activity doesn't finish after we do the screening and provide the results of the serology, but also the, uh, the, the activity also uh, continues by providing counseling to the participants and if they are eligible for treatment to help the participants to have access to the uh, medical center. We're doing a lot of the digital media and developing a web page and looking at uh, social media. <clears throat> I personally think it would be fabulous if we could get one of the Telenueva stars um, and have them be a spokesperson for the disease and even better incorporate a Chagas patient into one of the soap operas, one of the telenovelas, that would really carry a lot of weight. And we've reached out to, to many a uh, telenoeva star, um, and we've gotten very little response. There's one in the, in the wings now that may be interested, but I think if we, if we could find someone to get in on that level, at least from a, a Subject awareness that would that would have a pretty big impact. That's a great idea. I like that. So I I would maybe bring it from a more from a policy standpoint for Latin America. I would say uh, one, people are not being diagnosed, right? And there's no protocol on how do you confirm that they're being diagnosed. So many of the governments actually don't see that they might have so much of a problem. They don't really understand the depth of of the issue. Uh, also, um, the causes of death are not being attributed to Chagas, but they're attributed to some other components. So that's also creating, well, this is not a policy issue. This is not my priority. So there is no awareness because of that. There's no assigning of resources because of that. Um, I, I spoke with someone in Mexico that says, oh, this is not an issue for us. So they don't see it as an issue. The health so, minister doesn't see it as an issue. Because they're, the prevalence, they're not, they're not capturing it. I don't, I don't think that's the issue. I disagree. So that, that's a component that is happening. Um, and so there's no collateral. There's no social media strategies. There's no testimonial. So I think if we were to really drive this to be a, this is a health policy issue in these countries, then the whole campaign is developed, right? And I think that's where, um, where you can have a more comprehensive approach. I think Argentina completely knows that there's a problem. Brazil completely knows there's a problem. Colombia, I think there's a level of that awareness that they need to do something, but maybe some of the other countries, maybe there's more collaborative efforts. That's why I genuinely feel if we were to do this at a regional level, you also can optimize the resources. You do it once for the entire region, and this is then replicated. Each country can take those collaterals, that information, and really drill it down. A telenovela is normally covered in the whole region, so why can't we really take that consensus and really create, yeah, I, create I, I a, a wave. with what you're saying, absolutely. I, I think there's been a resistance because I've met with many health ministers in different countries, Mexico in particular, where they don't want to acknowledge that it's an issue and a problem. And, and how, how do you overcome that? Um, there's no easy solution for that. So those are all great points. Um, I want to come back and talk a little bit more about um, some of the points that, that you raised. Um, and that, I think that part of the issue here relates to um, when we're thinking about not just the awareness, but also now thinking about the screening, what role does screening play in some of these things? Um, there was a lot of discussion today about um, the types of screening you're doing, the, the testing that you're doing, and so on. I know that in Europe, they have actually also gone to a screening uh, approach, and that they actually did some uh, analysis, economic analyses looking at whether or not it was actually cost effective. And I was just wondering, given that you're in the process of designing these studies and collecting the data now, whether any of you have any plans to conduct some sort of economic analysis <laughs> to sort of actually put, uh, uh, well, 
Okay, maybe I should throw yeah. this out to the to the audience, but uh, you know, I I'll come back. Finish it. Finish it. You know, just need one more day to finish. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, well, since I, since we go down this path, why not? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we are very close to. Come. My so, name is so, Eileen Stillwag, and I'm an economist, and I teach at Gettysburg College. And um, we have a study that is completed. It's really just a matter of you know crossing the T's and dotting the I's to send it off. Um, we did um, a proposal for prenatal screening uh, among Latino women in the United States from endemic countries, and um, <clears throat> the. I mean, we believe that screening before pregnancy and screening the whole population uh, who are at risk is important, but we see screening pregnant women as the access point to the community. So that's why this is a model of um, the costs and benefits of uh, screening pregnant women, uh, because it may be the only point of access for, especially for undocumented populations who are afraid to uh, come in. So um, what we found is that the uh, lifetime costs of uh, undiagnosed and untreated uh, Tagus disease are um, 10 times the cost of a screening program. Uh, a lot of times people think that screening programs are expensive because, oh, you have to cover everybody and you're only going to find 1%. But in fact, screening programs are uh, incredibly uh, beneficial. The cost-benefit ratio is very low. Um, the costs are trivial, and uh, we found tremendous uh, benefits. So, and I promise it'll be out soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you heard it here first, folks. There's 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 a couple of analyses that are out there. Bruce Lee, who's at, at Hopkins, did an analysis. Um, and so there, there, there's some that are smaller scale, but I, I, it's pretty um, consistent across all the studies that there's a huge cost benefit. So forget your altruism and your humanitarianism. If you want to do it just for the bottom dollar, you should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's confirmed in the Spanish. Uh, the yes, that just Institute. came out. Uh, in fact, as of yesterday, yeah. they just came out with a uh, new one. Benefits are enormous. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, follow up on that, on the cost benefit. Um, Can you identify yourself? Please? Yeah, my name is Dick Salvatierra. I'm president of the America's Health Foundation. We're strictly policy in Latin America. And I want to share with you one of the problems dealing with uh, uh, government policy. We run the task force on dengue. And we've had, there's 13 countries in the world now that have um, registered the vaccine, I think seven or eight in Latin America. Nobody's buying it. That's a problem. Everybody knows, much like you're talking about Chagas, everybody knows about dengue. But why aren't the governments buying it? <clears throat> well, could be because it's expensive. It's three doses. The efficacy is not as high as it should be. <clears throat> Um, and then nobody dies from it. Not that literally nobody dies, but not sufficient numbers that this is important. <clears throat> so the strategy has to be changed, and this is what we're doing on our uh, policy issue, is to what is the burden of the disease. There will not be another competitive vaccine for three to five years so the cost of dengue might be high for the vaccine, but what is the cost and the burden of the disease to the population over the next three to five years when maybe a cheaper vaccine comes in? So how do you mobilize either public opinion, physicians, stakeholders to influence the government to make those decisions? We're running, we're running into the same problem with rare diseases. Nobody wants to deal with rare diseases in Latin America, pure and simply because of the cost. So even though the countries have passed laws and 
made access a human and citizen right, you bring a patient with a diagnosis and a prescription on rare diseases to a government, they don't want to touch it. So the, the problem we're facing in all of these, uh, whether neglected diseases, vaccines, or whatever is, what are the trade-offs? I mean, uh, the U.S. can go into debt better than most to cover almost anything it wants, but right now Mexico, um, their dollar or their peso is totally devalued. Um, they're having cuts. You all you have to do is look at Brazil and what a mess that is. So then you ask yourself, why should they give attention to Chagas over dengue, over oncology, over rare diseases? breast cancer, whatever. And the question, the problem is you're competing for limited resources and the only way to do it, I think, and I'm sorry for monopoly, this, I was gonna have a question, it's become more of a monologue, and I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the only thing left to do is how can you make the economic case to a government? And, and in Latin America, you have to change the government policy or it won't happen. Um, but I do have one question too, and that is we're talking about <clears throat> awareness, like a knowledge. Um, the, the problem is also information overload. Uh, we work heavily with pediatricians and, and pediatric uh, societies in every country, the regional ones, um, and we're asking them to be able to diagnose and everything of, of this multitude of problems, and they barely can handle vaccines, much less anything else. How do you get these pediatricians then to be more of a partner in the awareness of patients? panel discussion. Yeah, I, I can say that the, the trend in primary care and the funding that's gone towards primary care um, is based, the, the funding that they get, the, the waivers that are out there are contingent on meeting different measures. Um, and, and there's a litany of these measures and primary care providers, whether they're for adults or pediatricians, you're absolutely right. They're, they are so overwhelmed with all the checks and balances that they have to do in order to meet these waivers. So the way that we're trying to approach it in our organization is we've developed a standardized protocol for our nurses so that the nurses can order the Chagas titer, um, which takes the onus off the physician provider. Um, and it's just, you know, so if the physician forgets or is overwhelmed, at least there's a fallback. And, and nursing has been really um, vested in take, getting this off the ground in our facility. Just some other means to, to, to get to that screening. But it's, it's a huge problem, you're right. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's limited time and there's limited attention span. And um, I think one of the things that has also helped um, is essentially, I mentioned champions in the community, but also having champions. So starting small, um, you know, you can't roll out a nationwide sort of approach from the beginning, I think, in this case, approaching it really locally and having champions within the clinics themselves, actually, who help their colleagues um, to champion that and grow. And then as we see sort of the progress and the data, I mean, one of the big issues with any of these changes is we just don't have the data. So we, it's hard for us to make cases for a lot of the things that we all want to do because we just don't have enough data yet. Um, you know, speaking domestically, I mean, at least. So um, being able to find people who kind of encourage their colleagues in building that same sort of awareness also that we talked about, but within the medical, you know, professions. So. To, to Mary. I know I'm Andy, but uh, so 
I think from the resources are also important. The possibility of having a point of care test that can be done by any health professional uh, in the hospital may also help to the, with the rapid screening of the disease. Uh, also, the Dr. Chiba was mentioning is we know the risk factors that are associated with infection, but at the end, the doctor needs to look for a large list of risk factors of, of a large list of cities that are endemic for Chagas disease, but maybe develop a mobile uh, more mobile technologies like, for example, sun acts that may put uh, uh, the endemic cities that are uh, that are uh, highly uh, a highly risk for Chagas disease can also help in the rapid screening of Chagas disease in the health system. So I, I would say for, for Latin American countries, the, the requirements for recertification or continuous edu medical education varies. Some of them don't have those requirements. So once they've gotten their medical license, that's it. So if they, were, they covered Chagas at some point during their education, excellent. And they actually captured and really were interested in it, then great. And maybe that led to... Uh, identifying what the patient had. So I think those kind of requirements need to be put in place more more across the board. That doesn't exist. Uh, but also um, that would then help uh, that component. Also, I don't think it's so sexy. <laughs> Sorry to kind of say it like that. I think uh, I, I spoke to some cardiologists that focus on car cardiology as a whole, but they don't think about, well, the Chagas piece and how that's affecting, that's not of interest to them. You know, so it was very... It's encouraging when you find that one KOL that is just doing it really for the passion and really sees that he can really make a difference. There's, there's one KOL in Mexico that's doing that uh, to try to gather and, and create a, an, an actual list of patients that are having uh, heart failure due to Chagas and how do you, by gaining this level of information, you begin to identify that it's because they're not being treated correctly. They don't know how to, uh, how to identify who they are. Uh, he was saying that in one year he was able to identify 100 patients with Chagas that supposedly the reference institution identified in, I want to say it was 15 years. So there's obviously a gap. They're not even identifying it correctly. It's not a priority. It's not sexy. So it's kind of pushed into under the drawer. So I, I think we need to create a call to action by driving the importance of it. It's affecting a lot of people. Okay. I have a quick question for the group. So when a part of my role in our study in Northern Virginia is after we have these positives is making sure that we assess their insurance status. It's not part of the study, but we try to find out what their insurance is and try to get them into a program. And one of the barriers that I thought would be a problem would be the free clinics. The interesting thing when we made that presentation, everybody actually embraced this problem, was very happy to even even do the send the blood themselves if they had to to the CDC for confirmation and if the patient qualified get the drug they all seem to be excited and on board with this the the biggest barrier we're having that if the patients are I'll, I'll say that if the patients are insured it doesn't seem to be a problem to get them into a qualifying infectious disease physician or Kaiser but when they when they don't have insurance, most usually unauthorized, usually working unauthorized. So many of them, as you know, have two jobs. Um, either we're having trouble f tracking them down, or once we track them down, they seem to be sort of like, well, uh, that's okay. I'm like not going to go to care, or we can't get them into care. We try, we make the connection, and they don't call, and they don't call. So I'm kind of curious in this mentality of the patient. I'm talking about. I'll, I'll give you the average age of this group that's behaving like this is sort of in the 30 to 40, really the 40 age group that we're that we're having. And so I'm really, uh, you know, Rachel, Dr. Marcus, and I've been really struggling with trying to figure out how to address this population. So for any of you who are doing that. I would love to have your thoughts. Well, our experience is a little different because we, we, our outreach is in combination with the church health fairs. So we really have been very successful getting the patients in and we accommodate our schedule to theirs because they do work and they come in at odd hours or they may have to come in on weekends. But uh, there's been a couple that initially refused to, to come in, 
But that's where the church comes in because we call the health promoters, the promotores, and they call and they're like, mija, you have to go in and patients come in. So that hasn't been a rate limiting factor per se for, for us. Mm -hmm. um, and most of our patients happen to be female and I don't know if there's a difference there. These are all male. Because <laughs> the, the men I, I would imagine would be, um, but then we call the wives. <laughs> And, and, and that usually <laughs> that that usually uh, works out too. So of all our positives that we've had, there's only less than a handful that haven't come in for treatment. Thank you. And the other thing I just wanted to mention also in terms of of uh, developing these access programs, I really think that public health needs to be involved, and it seems like in in. Boston, Massachusetts, they're much more involved. Um, California, you know, they're intrigued, they're fascinated, but they're very hands off. Um, I know I've been working with, uh, on an advisory council in Texas, and the public health system has been really involved, and it's reportable there. But even despite the public health departments being involved, there are no resources to fund the activities. So there's so many limitations um, and challenges and, and barriers. But I think public health, it's like tuberculosis, you know. Public health took that on. And most TB programs in the US are highly successful because of public health. Um, so if we could somehow integrate them into the process more, that would be helpful. They're not that involved yet in Massachusetts. Oh, they're not? They will be. Okay, yeah, we, we've, had, we've had a lot of challenges with that. But can you, just to, can you just elaborate a little bit more on what you see as the distinction between the medical community versus the public health community in this setting? Well, when I, when I refer to the medical community, I'm talking about more the providers, the physicians right. who are giving okay. care. Uh, there are a lot of access programs that patients have through public health um, where they could do, for example, a lot of the screening. Okay. Um, and that would just open up more, do more doors and more venues um, to reach this patient population. Okay. Good. Can I mention an opportunity for Massachusetts um, in particular because um, Massachusetts is one of only two states that has universal neonatal screening for congenital toxoplasmosis. And tacking on a Chagas test in neonatal screening seems like uh, you have a positive political environment, it's sort of a, more of a sanctuary state, and tacking that on, now you're gonna miss 99% of the moms if the transmission rate is only 1%, but it's a start. Yeah. So, just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to um, speak for <laughs> the Department of Public Health, and um, I, unfortunately, a setback was when they removed Chagas from notifiable diseases, and that was yeah. part of a burden for, because they were trying to reduce the burden, we had a very long list of notifiable diseases. Um, but um, but uh, we're, that's something that we're actively working with them. So they're, they're open, so we're having those conversations, and I think that's a really great point, actually. Um, and as to say, I think Massachusetts has a lot of things going for it that would hopefully, um, that's why we're, we're sort of excited to be working on this, that would hopefully then provide an impetus maybe for other states as well to develop things. Um. Other thoughts? We have another question from the yeah. gentleman over there. Yeah, hi, I'm Ricardo Castillo from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we work in southern Peru, in Arequipa, which is known as the endemic area for Chagas in Peru. And 10 years ago in that, in that city, because that is urbanized Chagas, uh, the, the, the vector adapted well to the city, and, and, and we started studying that um, phenomenon. And 10 years ago, we had about 10% uh, of houses infested with this vector. After uh, successful application of IRS, now 1% um, of the houses has the vector. But now, I, I, I agree with Dr. Shiva that now the Minister, the minister of Health um, is rushing to proclaim that the area is free of the disease, which will be just um, terrible. That will cut funds for surveillance uh, of the vector and also of, of patients. And 
Um, so, so what we are uh, developing there is um, field strategies to use screening tools more effectively because uh, we know that it's cost effective to do screening, but I, I think that most uh, politicians or public health officers are thinking of the, the short term budget, right? And they are thinking of how much that screening is going to cost me this year, not, not how much that is going to save in 10 years. Um, so we're trying to, to build um, strategies, algorithms, spatial algorithms, uh, which are going to be a little different than here in the States because we're using the, uh, the movement of the vector, the presence of the vector, trying to understand where we can do screening and, and find cases. Um, but um, I can see in, in, in all the presentations that there are some common factors that you are finding in the populations in Boston, Baltimore, Virginia, and they are quite similar, uh, like living in the rural areas, having seen the vector, uh, and, and I wonder if, if you're thinking of maybe creating some kind of algorithm to target specific populations or, or just to, to use the, the tools that we have uh, more effectively. So uh, let me just add, that's a great question. I have one other question related to that, and that is, you know, we have certain risk factors that were identified here in the U.S., you know, and the question is, you know, to what extent do those risk factors necessarily carry over to other communities, um, and how generalizable could they be? Because that's going to—I mean, it's important if we're starting to talk about the U.S. versus uh, other sites. So, if you could also uh, address that point. So, whoever wants to go first. Um, okay. So, our study first started in the Bolivian population. So, we have we have found some risk factors that are very similar to the Bolivian population, uh, but we are expanding the study. Our uh, final sample size is almost 1,600 individuals. So we are now are going to continue enrolling the individuals from Central America and from different areas of uh, Mexico and also South America. So yes, and that is the idea also of doing this, this risk factor analysis to try to find specific risk factors that can be applied to uh, a, lo a large numbers of individuals of Latin American individuals individuals, but that can also be easy to use in the health system uh, because uh, there are many publications that already that we know the cities in each country that are uh, more, more endemic of Chagas disease. But what is not also, the doctors also, they, if they try to look each city uh, per city for each patient, is going to be also time consuming. So it's what is we try to do uh, technologies that can be easy to use uh, by the health system uh, using this risk factor analysis uh, may improve the algorithms of diagnosis and also to reduce the budget of the screening. Yes. There's actually an, uh, a mobile phone application that was developed uh, uh, in Colombia. Is it, in, is it Brazil? No, 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 I'm sorry, you're right. Sao Paulo. That's actually really, really good. Um, right. So um, there are, there's a lot we can do in terms of technology where you have it at your fingertips, uh, and it's, you know, you put in the criteria, and boom, it gives you a risk. So um, I, I think that's the direction we're heading in. They're, they're still perfecting it. But we're hoping to have access to that in the near future. That's very cool. I, I just wanted to add, I think in the spirit of collaboration, I think the great thing about this meeting is that, you know, we're all together and there's not that many of us doing this. And I think so standardization across even, you know, our studies, small as they may be, and then being able to sort of put that data together and report um, together will be really important going forward. So. I would really echo that because this is not only applicable for the U.S. but also for Latin America where maybe this level of experience isn't so much there. I would just think the diagnostics and screening and confirmatory process, if there is already an app in place, why recreate the wheel? There's already something there. Vector, vector control protocols or processes that could be done would be fantastic for this community. Uh, how do we then standardize or, or define various mechanisms on treatment protocols, uh, standardize the study so that way we have data of, of, of how it's happening in each one of these countries? So I mean, but this is, those are the kind of things that we need to define. So 
I, I remember the previous session we spoke a lot about, well, we just need medications. We just need, and we're seeing that it's not. That's not the only component. It's a 360 strategy. And if it could be defined by a sort of working group, then it's easy to, easy to implement in each one of these countries. I am Peruvian, Peruvian American. So it's fantastic that you're doing this work, work in Arequipa. How do we do that for Bolivia, for Brazil, for Colombia, for all these places that really need that help, you know? Uh, that's available to provide. Sorry. We'll give you this until. <laughs> I was just uh, saying to his point at uh, DNDI, we do have a Chagas Access Consultative Group that it's fairly new, but it was set up to address just this issue. It consists of experts from all over Latin America. And it's designed uh, for people who might need help developing a new treatment program uh, or, or diagnostic algorithm or, or what have you to get that up and started. So, I mean, if ever, anybody ever wants more information about that, they're welcome to contact me. And really, it boils down to having champions in the different regions to, to take this on. I, I think the information is there. Um, I think there's a lot of information. It's not our, our treatment, our diagnosis, our testing. It's not perfect, but we have access to a lot. Um, I think getting different health ministries to take ownership of this has been challenging. Um, and Colombia has been a great example of a success story. Um, because it's it's being driven by the health ministers. They're they're a part of the campaign. They're a driving force of the campaign. And until you really have that in these Latin American countries, you're not going to have the same level of success. So from my perspective, if we get this up and going in, in the U.S., I, I see that as being a, a driving force for these other ministries to hopefully follow suit. Last one? Oh, sorry. Okay. Great. Um, I'm Daisy Hernandez, and I'm here from Miami University. I'm probably the only person in the room who's from an English department. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm here because I'm working on a book project um, about patients living in the U.S. with Chagas disease. And I was wondering if the panel could talk a little bit about... Um, uh, the medical community and public health experts in terms of resistance to addressing Chagas. Um, I feel like, yeah, there's, there's been a reference to sort of medical education. Um, I recently heard from someone who was saying that the lack of um, medical training on um, parasites alone is a really, is a problem in the U.S. Um, but I'm sort of curious how open you have found the medical community and public health experts to be. Maybe I'll just complement the last comment and continue with that. Uh, uh, something very important with Chagas, I think, if, if I don't know if you read the MSF uh, book that had a poem by Eduardo Galeano before, and it says, it's a disease of the silent, and it, it kills the silent, to who, those who are condemned by oblivion. And usually Chagas, what I find is that uh, there's a lot of advocacy and uh, maybe stakeholders involved, but it's very detached to the patients. And we don't really have that poster child or someone we can relate. Maybe the patients can relate to, oh, he has Chagas the same as I am. I do. So that that's an important uh, point. For example, in, in Mexico, in in medical school, they uh, you usually know where it is endemic, but you always relate it to ho homes that are made out of adobe and the, in the rural areas. And you are more in contact once you're in your social service year, but then you don't have the medication. So it's... A complete cycle. And I used to work in an arrhythmia clinic, and we used to see those patients. It's not that they don't know about the disease or they're completely ignorant of what's going on. They know, and they know their family members have died of this and everything. I, I just, for example, I, I, the medical providers sometimes just don't know where to get the medication. Or one really big thing in maybe endemic countries is that if you provide the medication, you have to uh, give some follow-up. So the patient has to come back for some tests to see that there are no adverse effects, and that's really hard to get. So sometimes I think in the balance, uh, it's maybe not that uh, there is ignorance or resistance, but 
it's so challenging to treat a patient. Sometimes you have to balance if you should treat in, at the risk of them getting adverse effects or uh, what, what you should do. So that dilemma is very important. I don't know if there's a resistance per se of providers in the U.S. to treat. I think the majority that you speak to are really fascinated. I think I think physicians in the U.S. are are somewhat overwhelmed, uh, especially as I mentioned before, primary care providers as the gatekeepers. Um, and when you look at a lot of these health maintenance organizations, you have 10 minutes to see a patient, 15 minutes to see a patient. I can't say hello in that time frame, let alone see and diagnose and treat. So I think, you know, the art of medicine has kind of fallen by the wayside, and it's become more a business, unfortunately. Um, and I think... The, the medical education isn't really up to date, so a lot of physicians are practicing medicine like they did, you know, especially in particular with, with Chagas disease. <laughs> it's, it's an innocent mistake where they think the treatment isn't indicated. Uh, we've had, we have tons of patients who've gone from physician to physician to phys physician looking for treatment, and they're told repeatedly, oh, don't worry, you know, you don't you don't need to get treated. Um, so th 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 there, it's so multifactorial. But I don't know if it's necessarily a resistance. I think that would be unfair to say. Um, but it's multifactorial, and it's from education to access. I think the whole access to drugs issue in the U.S. is really, really, really li limiting because it's not easy to, to go through the whole IND process with the CDC to get the drug, and then the follow-up and the reporting you have to give back to them. Um, it's very arduous. Okay, well, I'm uh, being told that we, uh, our time is up, so let's have a round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much for your insightful comments.